Hello, Michael here with another Renderman tutorial. Today we're going to be having a look at the Pixar Voronoi's Pattern Generator. And this is used for doing all sorts of different types of procedural patterns. Um, it can be used for things like uh, making coral or um, cityscapes or bark on a tree, just to name a few things that I've used it for. I'm going to show you how to set it up though and what all the settings are and uh, maybe I'll show you how to make those specific examples in a separate tutorial. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is have a scene set up like I do here and some geometry. I've got a cube and you see I've got a light in the scene and a plane underneath just so I've got something to bounce some light off. Now we're going to select our cube, go to render man and click the uh, Pixar surface shader with your uh, object selected. Then we'll grab the Hypershade Editor and we'll map out our Pixar Surface Shader. This is this guy here. And we'll change this to be called Voronoise. So essentially in this tutorial we're going to be using the Voronoise Pattern Generator to create displacement so we've got some um, surface variation in our material. So first thing we're going to want to do is hit tab and type in Pixar V-O-R-O -O, and we get Voronoise. Alright so that one's in the scene. Um, we're also going to use this as a bump map so we'll type in PXR B-U-M-P get the bump map and uh, select your Voronoise and hit 3 to expand it and the same with your Pixar bump. We're going to run the result F into our input bump and then the result N out of our Pixar bump into our bump normal for our shader. And finally to control our Voronoise we're going to use a, a 2D manifold. So type in Pixar, M-I-N and we get manifold 2D. So essentially this is just a sort of um, place the noise on your geometry. You can use it to rotate it and scale uh, the width and height of it and offset it as well. So we're going to run the result into the manifold. We're also going to use uh, the Voronoise to create an actual displacement. So let's first add in a PXR displace node. And we don't need that one there. We'll run the out color into our displacement shader for our Voronoise. And um, we want to run this as a displacement scalar, which is just up and down basically displacement. So um, if you grabbed your RGB, you won't be able to plug it into your scale. You only get your vector. So we're going to use a PXR remap node. So I'm going to run the result RGB from your Voronoise into the input RGB, hit 3 on that one. And then we're going to run the result R into the displacement scalar. Now I could have just grabbed the RGB R from the Voronoise, but the reason we want to use the remap is because it, we can change our output range. So um, I'll show you what this renders up like so I can ex uh, explain the difference between not having a having a 0 to 1 output range and having a negative 1 to positive 1 output range. Alright, so as you can see our cube has been displaced, um, however all the edges have been shoved away from the original uh, geometry and that's because our range is 0 to positive 1. So what we want to happen with the Voronoise pattern is the any area that is black to be pulled inwards, any area that is 50% grey to be um, the same level as what your object is and anywhere to be white to be positive one away from the surface relative. So back in the Hypershade editor we'll select our PXR remap and then the output min will set to negative one. So now when we IPR it you'll see the difference that it makes and it's still not very pretty. Um, we need to make some adjustments to this to make it look a little bit better. And I think our background light is a little bit hot so we'll just change the intensity to one. So what is going on here? Well, I think this is best described with an image uh, on the Pixar re website. So um, this is on the, the Voronoise um, page on the RenderMan wiki. So essentially what the Voronoise is, is it's a square grid with a variation in value, um, ranging between a value of zero, black, or one white. And as you increase different values, it will alter the shape of each square and alter the focus of the square. And we'll see a bit more of that in um, a few minutes. But uh, it's good to have sort of have this as a reference so you sort of know what's going on and why things are happening when you increase the jitter or the smoothness. 
Uh, so in the hypershade editor, I'm going to grab our Voronoise node. So it's visible on our attribute editor. And then we're going to change a few values. Okay, to start off with our example, we're going to set the frequency to one, the octaves to one, the gain to one, the lessonarity to one, the jitter to zero, and the smoothness to zero. So with it set like that, you can see it sort of just gives you this random displacement. And um, it may also be worth just in this example, selecting our shader and going to advanced and enabling double slider just so we can see those inside faces a bit better. Maybe a cube isn't the best example for this, but um, I think it will probably be fine for most of this anyway. So the first thing we're gonna increase is the frequency. I'm gonna set it to three. Uh, so the frequency sets the starting value of the um, noise for this layer. So you can see the higher it gets, um, say if we just double this to six, it will get a lot more eccentric. And then the lower you get, so two, the more simplified it will be. Uh, the next thing we're gonna look at is lacinarity. Uh, that's because this is tied into how the octaves attribute works. So we're gonna uh, increase the lacinarity to a uh, value of three and run our IPR again. Uh, so you'll see no change to start with. If we double our octaves though, you'll start to see if I compare the, the two. Uh, the amount of noise in each octave or each level increases. So I can increase this as well. If I increase the octaves to three and then run the IPR, we'll start to get a lot more complex shapes. The next one is gain. Gain is kind of tricky to um, explain or give an example of. Essentially what I tend to do is set my gain to 1.0 and if I need to adjust the variation of my surface noise, um, I can start there as a, as a point. But at a value of 1.0, uh, we've got our render looking like this. However, if I double that, you'll see it's changed the shape slightly. And essentially is it, what it's doing is expanding the threshold in either direction so it can shrink some values and it can increase some values so you can see this um, octave here is getting taller where um, this octave here is getting shorter and that's because the values are expanding in either direction all right now we're on to jitter so remembering that jitter essentially is changing the overall shape of our cube so at the moment our render is producing uh, fairly even cubes. If we increase the jitter to say 0.3 from the IPR, you'll see that our cubes are starting to get a little bit more wacky. And obviously the more closer to a value of um, one, the more variation there will be um, between smaller, more offset cubes and larger um, larger cubes as well. And actually they, they do become beveled as well. They turn into five-sided, six-sided shapes as well, not just uh, your four-sided squares. And finally, we'll look at smoothness. So obviously at the moment, we've got a fairly um, hard edge displacement happening. If we increase the smoothness to stay 0.5 and run an IPR, you'll see the displacement becomes smoother, essentially. And that's because it sort of applies a Gaussian filter you can see here as we increase the smoothness. It sort of becomes more blurred out um, so your pattern image is becoming more blurred out and that's why the transition between uh, your lower values and your higher values or your, or your low displacement and your high displacement is smoother, essentially. And finally, you've got turbulent. Um, turbulent is somewhat self-explanatory. It just makes it turbulent, um, as you can see there. It's a, it's a zero, one value. It's either on or off. Um, but it's you know pretty straightforward to understand um, if you're looking for some wackiness in your objects then that's what you want to do and finally I'll just briefly look at the uh, manifold node um, so S and T are pretty obvious scale S and T are pretty obvious if I increase this to 3 on the S for example and run the IPR the cubes are going to become elongated on the S vector um, and then the same obviously if I increase it on the T vector as well uh, the other thing worth noting is the angle. So if I change the angle to 45, for example, uh, and I'll change the scale S to 1 again, you'll see that all of our cubes um, have been turned on a 45 degree angle. So now, relative to the camera position, they're actually diamonds. Now, hopefully it should be becoming somewhat obvious that what you could use this 
noise for when you're creating displacements and bumps. Um, you can already sort of see that uh, this could be the silhouette of a city skyline, um, which is something I've been using it for recently. Uh, you could obviously increase the smoothness and then you'd get something like um, rolling hills, for example. And this can just end up saving you time and getting, because you're using randomness and nature is seemingly random. So um, when you've got a nice variety of shapes in your horizon your you know rolling hills will appear more believable rather than if you had designed them if that's what you're going for um, so that's pretty much it for this tutorial i will be looking at the voronoi's uh, noise maker again in the future and in how in a how do i render tutorial so if you want to see that one make sure you're subscribed um, and as well as that i'm putting out a couple of tutorials a week so you should be subscribed so you can catch those um, if you found this video useful uh, make sure you click the like button so other people can find it on youtube and if you want to stay up to date further check out the facebook page uh, link in the description that's it for now though thank you very much for watching and happy rendering